All right, so welcome to the fifth video in this orchestration series. In the last video, we covered a handful of common playing techniques that are available to you when orchestrating for strings, including different bowing techniques and both natural and artificial harmonics. In this video, we're gonna finally wrap up our discussion on the string section by covering some basic strategies and techniques that you can use when actually orchestrating your music. We'll start by covering the default starting point for all string writing. Then we'll discuss some additional techniques for working with harmonies, and finally wrap things up by discussing a few additional possibilities for using the strings to present your melodic material. So with that, let's get started. Jumping right in, the default method for writing string parts is to use four-part voicing, or SATB voicing. In this configuration, the first violin is treated as the soprano voice, the second violin is treated as the alto voice, the viola is treated as the tenor voice, and the cello and double bass are both seen as the bass voice, sharing it and playing it in octaves. A proper understanding of four-part writing is incredibly important for every composer to have, if only because it helps make sense of writing harmonic lines. It really deserves its own separate video, but for now, let's just cover a few of the basics. So here we have a simple chord progression and melody. Our chords are F major, G major, E minor, and A minor in first inversion. Our first step when four part writing is to assign the melody to one of our four voices. By default, this is typically going to be the soprano voice, since it has the highest pitch register and thus is most likely to grab the attention of the listener. For us, that means that we'll be placing the melody in our first violins. Our next step is to write out the foundational harmony, or the bass line. The role of the bass line is to anchor all of our harmonic material into place, and its importance can't really be overstated. A solid bass line helps give you more freedom in what you do with your other harmonic voices. They can move around and experiment with different configurations and tones much more safely, as long as they have a nice, strong anchor to rely on keeping them in place. To write our bass line, we simply take the root notes of our chords and assign them to the cellos and the basses in octaves. Now that we have our melody and our bass line, it's time to assign the final notes of our chords to our remaining two voices, the altos and the tenors, or the second violins and violas. The basic rule of thumb here is to assign these notes to each voice in a way that helps us avoid as much movement as possible. That way they don't distract from the melody. Right off the bat, I know that I want to assign the C's and the B's to one voice. These two notes are separated only by a single half step, so they're pretty much as close as we're going to get when it comes to avoiding movement. This leaves us with the other voice going A, D, G, and D. This is a little less ideal. We're starting and stopping on the same note, which is nice, but there's an entire perfect fourth between A and D, and an entire perfect fifth between D and G. That's quite a bit of movement. Right off the bat, this tells me that I want to place the C and B line in the second violins. That way, any movement that we do end up with is going to be separated from the melody by being placed in a separate register. Then I'm going to try and reduce this movement by shortening my A and my D notes, and adding a short C and a short B in there both of which are notes that appear in the chords being used. Now, this might seem a little confusing. After all, I did say that we want less movement, not more. So why am I adding more notes? Well, in my own personal opinion, large leaps between notes are a little more distracting than a tiny bit of rhythmic activity. By adding just two short notes, we're able to break up the space between each note in the viola's line and make it sound much smoother. Now our largest interval is in this line is a major third, where there was originally a perfect fifth. Now this isn't the only way that these notes could have been voice led. Some people might even find other approaches to be more effective, but personally, I really enjoy the sound of this one, and that's what really matters. You need to find solutions that work for you. The guidelines in this video are, are just that, guidelines. They're not hard rules or laws. They exist to help you get started. So once we finish that, the last thing we want to do is make sure that each of these voices is assigned to an appropriate register, given the instruments performing them. Keeping in mind that the strings can be written in either open or closed voicings in their upper voices. So the basses and cellos are good. 
They're both nestled nicely in their lower registers to provide a nice, strong anchor to the voices above them. The violas also seem to be quite at home in their lowest octave. As you may recall, this is the most idiomatic range for them and provides a nice opportunity to use their richest register. The second violin is nestled neatly an octave above the violas, keeping well below E5. Remember that anything above the staff on violin is going to have added carry power. So keeping the second violin on the staff helps ensure that it won't compete with the first violin. Speaking of which, the first violin is playing neatly around the top of the staff, sometimes even venturing above it, which helps make use of a nice strong register to help it carry over the rest of the voices. So let's give this a quick listen. That sounds pretty nice to me, and for all intents and purposes, this is a perfectly valid and nicely orchestrated passage for the string section. However, it's not the only approach that we can take. Sometimes we want a little more movement in our harmonies, and not just a series of long, sustained notes. In this case, we can use another common methodology for writing strings that we'll call harmonic voicing. Harmonic voicing is a type of part writing that gives several of the harmonic lines their own personality, or their own voice. For example, here is the same exact melody and chord progression that we were working with earlier, but this time orchestrated using a simple harmonic voicing strategy. Notice how it has a different feel to it than the last arrangement. There's a little more color and a little less stability. This is due to the introduction of much more material and movement to the passage. Now, there are many, 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 many different strategies that you can use for utilizing harmonic voicing in your own music. But for now, let's just cover one simple strategy. Our first two steps are going to be nearly identical to the four-part writing strategy. We'll assign the melody to our first violins, and we're going to assign the bass line to our double bass, but this time we'll leave out the cello. Our bass line is still super important in the strategy, maybe even a little more so than the last one, as it allows us to get a little crazy by keeping us anchored to the harmonic bed, or to the chord progression. The third step is to treat the cello, viola, and second violin as more independent from each other than in the previous strategy. Rather than simply playing sustained notes, each voice can have its own rhythm, its own contour, its own little melody, whatever you want. However, with that being said, it can be super easy to slip up and have the harmony steal the focus from your primary melody. In order to keep this from happening, you want to try and stick to three guidelines as much as possible. Number one is stick to chordal tones as much as possible. The safest strategy is to stick to using just the three notes in whatever triad you happen to be working with at the moment. If we look at our example, we'll notice that each part does exactly this. First, we have the celli, which only play a single pitch for each chord. First an F from the F major, then a G from the G major, then an E from the E minor, and finally an A from the A minor first inversion. Next, the viola also sticks to simple chordal tones, this time using C and A from F major, D and B from the G major, B and G from E minor, and finally E and C from A minor. The second violins follow suit with A and C from F major, B and D from G major, G and B from B minor, and finally C and E from A minor. The second guideline is to create variations of the full chord with your three voices and bass line as frequently as you can. Because you still need to fulfill the responsibility of providing the harmonic material in your piece, even if harmonic voicing gives you more freedom in how you do it. Returning to our example, we'll see that the very first chord, F major, we have the celli and the basses doubling on the first, which is F, with the viola on the fifth, or C, and second violins on the third, or A. The celli and basses remain constant, keeping on that F, but the violas and second violins switch around a little bit, but always maintaining the same basic chord throughout the entire measure. 
This pattern continues for the remaining chords in the progression. Now, harmonic voicing doesn't always need to be this straightforward. You can venture away with some non-chordal tones, but you want to make sure that you don't forget to create at least some variation of the underlying chords whenever possible. And finally, the third guideline is to use as much repetition in each voice as possible. This will be one of your strongest tools in keeping the voices from overtaking the melody. Repetition is boring to the human ear, and it quickly falls into the background where this kind of material belongs. If you're too fresh or too interesting with your material, it'll be difficult to keep the audience's attention on your foreground. So if we look back at our example one final time, we'll see that the celli seem to be repeating the same rhythmic line over and over again. It goes quarter note, eighth note, quarter note, eighth note, eighth note, eighth note. This pattern repeats for each chord, remaining on a single note every time. The violas copy this rhythmic pattern, but create their own unique variation of it by moving between various pitches. In particular, it starts on the fifth of the chord, leaps up to the third, and then moves up one last time to the fifth for the remainder of the measure. This pattern repeats for the entire phrase. Finally, the second violins deviate from the established rhythmic motif, just a little, by reusing the quarter note eighth note intro before sustaining a single pitch for the remaining two and a half beats. Pitch-wise, they repeat the same idea of third to fifth back to third again for every chord. So just to recap, when using harmonic voicing, you want to start with the melody in the bass line, then write the remaining three voices while... 1. Sticking to chordal tones whenever possible, 2. Arranging full voicings of the underlining chords whenever possible, and 3. Using repetition to keep the material in the background. So now we have some pretty solid strategies for writing for the strings. But what if we want to push it just a little bit further? What if we want to write more than five voices? Maybe we want the violas to play chords, or the cellos to play multiple melodic lines. If this is the case, we have two more strategies at our disposal, divisi and double stops. Each one has its own strengths and weaknesses, so we'll cover each one individually and then compare them. First up, we have double stops. Double stops refer to chords consisting of two notes played on a single stringed instrument. Since stringed instruments can produce pitches from each of their four strings, it is possible for them to produce two note, three note, or even four note chords. These last two options are called triple and quadruple stops, respectively. A double stop is performed by performing two notes at the same time. However, given the curved nature of a stringed instrument's bridge, triple and quadruple stops are typically performed as two double stops in quick succession. Like this. Now, it is possible for a triple stop to be played all at once. But this requires a lot of force on the strings, which forces you into using a louder dynamic in your music. Now, writing these chords are not as simple as just picking two to four notes that you want your player to perform. Although a computer can play any number of notes on a sound library and make it sound great, this does not mean that the chord is possible on a real stringed instrument. In order to make sure that each of the chords you write for an instrument are actually playable, you need to make sure that each note in the chord is played by its own string, because no individual string is capable of playing more than one note at a time. A quick method for telling if a chord is possible to play is to check each note and see if their pitches are the same as or higher than the fundamental pitches of each string on your instrument. If they are not, then the chord is not playable. For example, here we have three versions of the same chord, a C major. We don't know which one we want to go with yet, but we do know that we want it to be performed by the viola. We also know that the viola's open strings are tuned to a C3, G3, D4, and A5. So let's look at each of these chords and see if any of them are possible to play. First up, we have the closed voicing C major chord, starting on a C3. The first note, C3, can easily be played by our viola, since it is the same pitch as the viola's lowest string. The same goes for G3, that's the same pitch as the viola's second lowest string. However, we get stuck at the E3, 
E3 is lower in pitch than G3. So the G string, D string, and A string can't possibly perform this note. The only one that can possibly perform it is the C string. But in this particular case, it can't because it's already performing the C3 and can't possibly perform both notes at the same time. Since we can't perform all three notes, this first chord is impossible to play on the viola. Next up, we have an open voicing C major chord starting on the C3. Just like the first chord, we know that the C3 and G3 are both performable by the viola's lowest strings. But now we need to see if we can perform the E4. And we're in luck. The third lowest string, the D string, is lower in pitch than E4 and can easily perform this note. This version of the chord is therefore possible to play. Finally, let's look at our third option, the first inversion C major chord starting on E3. We know that E3 can be performed by the C3 string, since E3 is higher in pitch than C3. We also know that the G3 note can be performed by the G3 string because they are the same pitch. But when we look at C4, we run into another issue. The C string and the G string are already busy, but the C4 is lower in pitch than D4, so it can't possibly be performed by either of the remaining strings. This means that yet again, this is an impossible chord to play on a single viola. Now, this principle applies to any chord that you could possibly want to write for a single stringed instrument whether it has two or three or four notes. In order for it to be possible, every single note needs to have its own string. However, just because a chord is possible to perform does not mean that it's a good choice to use, because not all chords sound the same, and many of them are very difficult to keep in tune or to even perform with any proper amount of power to them. This is because within the limited number of possible chords, we still have efficient and inefficient chords that we're working with. An inefficient double, triple, or quadruple stop can be very difficult to keep in tune for a full section, or even nearly impossible to perform smoothly for any given performer. For these reasons and more, it's not enough to just find out if a chord you want is possible to perform. You need to find out if it classifies as efficient or inefficient as well. An efficient chord can be identified as one that fits the following three criteria. One, it doesn't skip any strings. So every note in the chord is played on an adjacent string. Two, notes played on adjacent strings are within a third to a sixth from each other. And three, the chord makes use of one or more open strings. If a chord is missing any of these three criteria, then it should be classified as inefficient and you should really consider rewriting it or just ditching it altogether. There are, of course, exceptions to every rule. However, unless you're an experienced string player yourself, I really strongly urge you to follow these criteria whenever writing your own music. However, if you really fall in love with the sound of a particular chord in your music and you insist on using it despite any amount of inefficiency or even impossibility, there is still one more option for including it in your piece, and this is called divisi. Divisi is a technique in which an entire section of instruments divides themselves into equally sized groups to perform a chord or multiple parts together. Let's say that you just really love the sound of the violins performing a perfect fourth between G3 and C4. This is impossible to perform on a single violin, and you've already assigned the first violins to the melody. But if you take your second violin section of 14 players and have seven of them perform G3 and seven of them perform C4, well then suddenly you're able to have the interval performed in your music. However, there is a huge caveat to this. Divisi makes a sound quieter, not stronger. You're literally cutting the number of players you have in half for each note. Sound libraries rarely take this into account and will instead make it sound like you still have 14 violins performing each note. 
And it's incredibly important for you to keep in mind that anytime you use Devisi, it will come with a reduction in overall power in the sound. The more notes you need a Devisi to perform, the weaker the sound becomes. Now, this can be incredibly useful for moments when you want a chord or maybe some harmonic voicings to be kept in the background. But it can also be frustrating if you're looking for a huge sound for your chords. So when deciding on whether you should use Devisi or double stops, you should consider these general suggestions. Efficient double stops add additional strings and power to the mix. As such, they are excellent choices for powerful rhythmic rolls, big sustained chords, or dramatic solo passages. They're also a little more difficult to play, so they're not the best choice for passages that are going to have a very fast harmonic rhythm, or with chords that switch very quickly. Devisi offers you more freedom than double stops, but it divides the overall power of your sound. As such, they're better suited for placing the string section intricately into the background. They're also, in general, easier to perform than double stops, so you can get a little more intricate with your part writing. When notating these options, you simply write Divisi over a passage where you want to use Divisi, or non Divisi over a passage where you want to use double stops. If you don't do either of these, the general approach is for players to split into Divisi by default, so just keep that in mind. To end a Divisi section, you can simply write unison over the passage. Now let's change up the pace for the last few minutes of this video and discuss melodic opportunities for the string section. In an earlier video, we already covered how each of the string instruments are ideal options for presenting melodic material. We even covered a few examples in this video on using the first violin section to present melodies. However, there are two more very common uses of the string section that I would like to introduce. The first is using the strings to present the melody during a climactic moment. And the second is presenting the melody using a solo stringed instrument. So during climactic moments in music, it's not uncommon to have a whole lot of stuff going on in the background and the midground. This means that you really need to bring your A game when you're orchestrating your foreground material. Pretty often this means finding a big voice to perform the melody. The string section as a whole makes for an ideal choice in these moments since their homogeneous nature allows them to blend together into a massive wall of sound. Between the violin sections, the violas, and the celli alone, you can place the melody in four different octaves, spanning all the way from low to high registers. This places the melody evenly throughout the entire sonic space of the orchestra and lends an incredible power to your material. When orchestrating a climactic melody for the strings, it's just as simple as picking an appropriate and desired octave for each instrument to perform the melody in. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have solo performances. The primary reason to use a solo performer rather than, say, a full section at any given point is typically about tone color. A single violin sounds very different from a full violin section. It's much more intimate, more personal, and even a little more dramatic depending on how you use it. Now, soloists should have no problem whatsoever being heard over the rest of their section or even over the rest of the whole orchestra, so long as you pay careful attention to your differentiation, in particular, your dynamic and your pitch differentiation. Whenever you want a soloist to take up the foreground, you want to make sure that they have the loudest dynamic in the orchestra. For example, if the solo violinist is playing forte, or loud, then the rest of the section should be marked at the very loudest as mezzo forte, or only somewhat loud. Preferably, you'd write them even quieter. However, when the difference between the dynamics isn't that big, pitch differentiation can still help keep a soloist in the foreground. By placing the soloist in the highest register being used at the time of their solo, you give them an extra edge in standing out. Likewise, you'll want to make sure that the background material is placed in the lower registers, especially the voices that have similar tone colors to the soloist, like other string players. As long as you pay attention to these two issues, you should have no problem having your solos heard. And with that, 
we've reached the end of another video and the end of our focus on the string section. In the next video, we're going to move on to studying the brass section. Those videos will follow the same basic patterns that these did. We'll start with a brief overview of the instruments most commonly found in the brass section, followed by a look at the most common playing techniques you're likely to find in a sound library, and then finally with a video focused on the best practices for orchestrating and using the brass section in general. After that, the plan is to cover the woodwinds before diverging into a few videos on other important orchestration techniques, things like doubling instruments. And once we're done with those, we'll cover the percussion section, a few videos on keyboard instruments and the harp, and then we'll finally wrap up this entire series on orchestration by going through my own step-by-step -step process for how I actually approach orchestrating a full piece of music. After that, I'm still trying to plan out what the next series will focus on, but I'm thinking of either a step-by-step -step lesson series on how to write a full piece of music from scratch, or a short series that would go a little more in-depth on how to mimic the writing styles of composers like Joe Hisaishi, John Williams, and Hans Zimmer. But in the meantime, thank you so much for your continued support and for your incredible patience these past few weeks, as I took a little longer than I'd like to get this video put together. My work schedule has been picking up like crazy lately, which I'm grateful for, but it's definitely cutting into my time to make these videos. So moving forward, I'll do my best to continue getting out at least one video every two weeks and one video every single week whenever possible. So if you'd like to be alerted when new content gets released, please like and subscribe to this channel and please share it with anyone you think might find it helpful. Until then, uh, just keep working hard, keep uh, studying, keep writing, and uh, keep learning. All right. Best of luck.